Welcome to the Folk Center for International Business in our Fall Forum. I am Karen Brocious, Executive Director of the Center, and we so appreciate your participation in today's wonderful event. The Folk Center is the hub for global business education, research, and leadership at the Darla Moore School of Business here at the University of South Carolina. We pursue the Center's mission with a passion to advance leadership and pioneer ideas to help businesses and communities thrive in a complex interconnected world. Internationally, the Moore School partners with 80 of the top business schools in the world to provide our students with unmatched global le learning experiences. We are the place for innovation and leadership in international business, a place for thinking doers and doing thinkers. We create, connect, and collaborate thanks to our partners throughout business, government, economic development, and academia. We share ideas and singular insights to address some of the toughest international business challenges and help shape our students to become the next generation of future world-class leaders. We have a great audience today of more than 450 participants for what I am sure will be a scintillating presentation and conversation by David Firestein. We welcome him not only as our keynote speaker, but also as an honored professor who spoke to a class of international business majors and journalism students this morning. His experiences gave our students new ways of thinking about globalization that can help shape their future paths and perspectives. Our deep appreciation to Governor and Rachel Hodges for their generous support of our forum series. Our partners at U of SC's School of Journalism who share our international commitment, my Moore School colleagues for their expertise and time, and to members of our Folk Center Global Advisory Board who have joined us here today. It is my pleasure to introduce you to the Dean of the Moore School, Pete Bruce, to greet you all and welcome our University President, Bob Caslin. Thank you so much, Karen, for that wonderful introduction. And I am so excited to be welcoming over 450 people to this event. The Moore School is very proud of international business standing and its rankings in both undergraduate and graduate international business education. 20 countries, as well as the United States, um, involved in this event. It's just the epitome of what we are trying to do in international business and international education. I am so looking forward to our speaker, who is the sixth in the series of this type that has been introduced by the Folks Center. And he follows people like a former president of Tunisia and Bull Rada, the founder and CEO of Hermitage Capital, who was involved in the Magnitsky Act to punish Russian human rights violators. And David, just to say that we, I think we've had Russia covered in the last couple of sessions, and now we're getting China covered. And thank you so much for joining us this afternoon to tell us about uh, US-Chinese relations. It would also be important for me to thank Dean Tom Reichert, who I think is on this meeting. I know that he was registered. But Tom, thank you so much for introducing us to David. And I know that David, you spoke to some of our students this morning. And uh, little birds have told me that your presentation went really well. And I suspect that uh, this one is going to be even better. So thank you so much for joining us. May I also thank uh, Governor Hodges for his incredible support for this event and the six other events that have happened at the Falk Center at this level uh, since 2017. I do want everybody to know that we have almost 200 students attending this event, which is really in, a, in alignment with our teaching mission. We have four parents, which is equally important to know because we want our community to know that parents have access to this uh, sort of event. We have 155 organizations represented. We have 16 public sector employees. We have 12 presidents, uh, 12 CEOs, 33 directors, and we also have five deans attending this particular event. And when you hear about that, you think, wow, this is an amazing group that have come together. Equally, we have representatives from top corporations in the United States and elsewhere, including Boeing, Volvo, Google, JP Morgan Chase, a range of uh, consulting firms. 
And of course, there's always a risk when you mention names that you miss people, but if your name has not been mentioned, forgive me, Karen is already on my back to get out the way and stop talking. I did want to say that we have a representatives from the Oman Investment Authority. We have members of the Chinese mission to the UN. We have uh, representatives from the SC Department of Commerce. And we even have one representative from the state of Connecticut Judicial Department and one final special guest from the Chinese embassy that President Bob Caslin is going to welcome as soon as I've introduced him. It's my delight now to introduce our president, Bob Caslin. Uh, president Caslin is the 29th president of the University of South Carolina, and he's been with us for just over a year. He is a retired uh, Lieutenant General with a long and distinguished military career and he retired from his army responsibilities as the superintendent and president of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. And uh, during the time that he was uh, the superintendent, the academy was recognized as the number one public college by U.S. News and World Report and by the Forbes magazine. Um, along with his degrees from West, for his degree from West Point, he is a graduate of West Point. He holds a degree in an MBA in finance and a master's in industrial engineering. I must say that this last year has been challenging for us all, but I don't think it could be more challenging for anybody at this university than President Caslin. And Mr. President, as I said to you when you came and met with our army group a couple of weeks ago, you have provided us and are continuing to provide us with a master class in crisis management in the way that you have led our university through these very, very difficult times. Thank you so much, sir, for being with us tonight, this afternoon. And uh, thank you for being here. That's from me. Thank you very much, Peter. I appreciate it very much. Uh, what a, what a incredible dean that we have. And I'm going to brag about him just for a second. Uh, thank you very much, Karen Brasillas, for inviting me to be with all of you today at the Folk Center Forum. And thank you to everybody who's participating in this incredible event today. I also want to give special thanks to several special guests. Uh, Mr. Neil Bush, the founder and chair of the George H.W. Bush Foundation for U.S.-China Relations. Zhang Zhou Zhang, the first secretary of the Chinese Embassy to the United States in Washington, D.C. Sir, please forgive me for my pronunciation. It's the best I rehearsed. But uh, thank you so much for being here, and it's an honor to have you uh, with us. Also, today's guest speaker, David Firestein, the presidency of the George H.W. Bush Foundation for U.S. and China Relations. And it's always a pleasure to welcome Governor Jim Hodges, the chair of the Folk Center. Sir, honor to have you with us uh, this afternoon. With the number one undergraduate international business program in the nation, and the number one graduate international program international business degree program in the nation. It's always a pleasure and quite frankly, very easy to brag about the Darla Moore School of Business of which uh, Dean Peter Bruce is the Dean of. So uh, it's, they're an incredible school. Mil the Moore School students and the faculty are literally changing the world. The Folk Center support their incredible work through important perspectives, programs, and we very much enjoy the partnership with you all. The Folk Center Forum provides an important opportunity for sharing conversation about the world and the intersection of education and the global marketplace. And with that, again, welcome to the University of South Carolina, everyone. Thank you for having me and enjoy this excellent dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Caslin. And we are delighted you could join us today. Please now welcome Governor Jim Hodges, who is chair of our Global Advisory Board of the Folk Center for International Business and former governor of South Carolina. Jim? Karen, how are you? Good to be with you today. And uh, certainly thanks to Peter Bruce and to Bob Caslin, two great ambassadors for our university, and Karen to you as well for putting this event together. Really excited to hear uh, David Firestein today. I, he, he is uh, a well-regarded, as a China scholar, a very thoughtful person, someone who has much to tell us today, and we're very pleased to have him from Austin, Texas, joining us virtually in this program. Uh, a couple of words I do want to say, if I could. First, uh, I do chair the uh, Folk Center Board 
uh, really excited to do that for a couple of reasons. One is it gives me a chance to be engaged with my alma mater. Uh, I'm both a business school and a law school graduate uh, and also happen to know Randy Folks. Uh, he and I are from the same hometown and a big admirer of the work that he has done that continues on with people like Jerry McDermott and Kendall Rolfe and the whole team. Uh, the international program at the university is, is unique in business education. I think it's part of what makes our, our alma mater such a special place is the focus on, on international edu business education. In addition to that, as many of you know, South Carolina is an international state uh, where we have a large percentage of jobs that are the result of uh, foreign direct investment by companies from across the wor world, including China. Uh, and we're very excited about that because I think it is the blueprint for how South Carolina continues to grow and develop. The Folk Center is involved in talking about that and how we can uh, better ensure that we have outstanding uh, students who can serve international companies across the world. And in addition to that, how we as a board can be engaged in trying to improve the educational experience that these students have. Part of that experience for the South Carolina business community for the greater South Carolina community and for our university is providing stimulating speakers who talk about business and world affairs. Uh, my wife, Rachel, who I think is somewhere out there in the ether sphere today listening to this, but Rachel and I began talking a couple of years ago about ways that uh, we could uniquely give back to the business school that were consistent with our values and experiences that we had had. And, and Rachel and I agreed that one of the things that we felt was lacking in universities was bringing uh, public affairs, people who have been involved in public and civic affairs, uh, who have done a diplomacy and who are involved uh, in a number of issues at the end of, of that level, bringing them to campus and having business students who focus on business issues understand the importance of public, of public affairs and of uh, government entities in impacting many of those issues before them. And that's how this program began. The uh, Rachel and Jim Hodges Forum uh, was trying to bring great speakers onto the campus that we think would be provocative and stimulating. Uh, and we have such a speaker here today. Uh, he is speaking on a topic of interest to me. Uh, I did uh, work for about a five year period um, in and out of China for a series of clients, fascinating area of the world. And Rachel and I happen to believe, as I think the university believes, that engaging on issues and having real conversations about important global events is an important part of our education. And to not have dialogue and discussion and not to talk about our differences and talk about the future uh, diminishes the educational experiences of our students. That is why we're here today. We have an exciting speaker that we're gonna hear from. Karen Gracious will tell you a little bit more about him uh, and I look forward to the program. Karen? Thank you, Governor. It's my pleasure to turn the program now to Jerry McDermott, professor in the Sunoco International Business Department at the Moore School and the faculty director of the Folk Center. Jerry. Thank you, Karen, and thanks to everybody here today. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I would just like to say a few things, as you may have already or heard. The ground rules, basically, on Zoom are that we ask you to keep your audio muted and your video muted. And if you have any questions or comments, please send them via the chat to only to me, the moderator, okay? And that was easy enough to find there. Uh, I will then channel your questions and comments to our speaker as they come in. Uh, our speaker will uh, present for about 45 minutes and then we'll have an open Q and A uh, session. I also want to uh, give a shout out, of course, as we mentioned before, to our wonderful partners at the School of Journalism and Mass Communications, who really, without them, this would never have happened. So we're infinitely uh, grateful to them. To I see a, many members of our Folk Center board out there, my MIB class, some wonderful undergraduates, and of course my colleagues. But now for the main event, you know, the Folk Center of International Business, the IB department in general, have built their reputation as leaders in international business really through a interdisciplinary approach to analyzing business around the world. 
And as you all know, any good strategy cannot begin without a careful understanding of the business environment you are in or you're entering. The knowledge that David Firestein brings to us essentially sets the foundation upon which one would assess future risks and opportunities in broader Asia, especially China, and also for US industries abroad. David Firestein is the inaugural president and CEO of the George H.W. Bush Foundation for US-China Relations and founding member of the Board of Directors. He has served our country as a longtime decorated US diplomat, international leader and advisor, expert in Russian affairs, Asian geopolitics, and of course, on China. We are deeply honored to have him here today. He's a native of Austin, Texas, where he's based. Indeed, he has previously played large roles at his alma mater, the University of Texas at Austin, where he was the founding executive director of the China Public Policy Center and was a member of the university faculty. Of particular note, he is one of the few Americans who is concurrently affiliated with two US presidential legacy entities, the Bush China Foundation, of course, and the LBJ School of Public Affairs, where he serves on the Dean's Advisory Council. Among the honors he garnered during his diplomatic uh, career were the Secretary of State's Award for Public Outreach and the Linguist of the Year Award. He's been recognized as, quote, one of the world's best non-native speakers of Mandarin Chinese. And early in his career, he interpreted for dozens of top level US and Chinese officials, not to mention that he also speaks fluent Russian. In the years since he left the State Department, Mr. Firestein has produced influential Capitol Hill testimony, thought leadership and scholarship on a wide range of international issues. Please welcome David Firestein. David. The floor is yours, so to speak. Jerry, thank you so much for the very gracious introduction. I don't think it could have been any more gracious if I had written it myself. Um, I'm so grateful for your warm welcome. I wanna thank Karen, of course, for uh, her instrumental role in making this uh, possible. Uh, Dean Bruce, President Caslin, Governor Hodges, Mrs. Hodges, uh, it is such an honor for me to be with all of you uh, virtually uh, via Zoom and to be able to speak about a topic that is so important for our country. And I think in one way or another for all of us, I only wish that I could be there with you in person. I very much hope uh, to be able to do that in the future. Uh, but for now, it is really a delight to be with all of you via Zoom. Um, let me just say at the outset that today is October 1st. Uh, for those of you who are from China and who celebrate the Chinese National Day, which is today, I want to extend my warm wishes and greetings for a happy National Day uh, for the People's Republic of China. Today is China's 71st birthday. So I want to extend those greetings to our friends from China. And as well, I would like to extend uh, warm greetings on the occasion of the Mid-Autumn Festival uh, which happens to coincide this year uh, with the China's National Day. To my friends at the University of South Carolina, uh, I want to extend a different type of greeting. And I want to say something uh, as we are here in presidential season in this country uh, with about 34 days to go before uh, the presidential election. I want to say something that no candidate for president in his or her right mind would ever say. And that's the following words. Go South Carolina, beat Florida when you play number three ranking Florida this Saturday. Uh, that is going to be a tough game. I have to say I am a fan of uh, Gamecock football. I follow the Gamecocks. I looked at your schedule for this season and I noted that in the 10 game season that you have, you're playing 10 teams in the top 23. And you know you have a tough season when LSU is the fourth ranking team that you're playing out of those 10. Uh, it is incredible. I wish you the best uh, on Saturday against a very tough Florida team. 
and I wish you the best in a very difficult season that you've got ahead of you. And let me just say, spurs up, y'all. Let's get this done on Saturday. And best wishes to Co Coach Muschamp and, and uh, Gamecock Nation. Now let me um, get into uh, the subject matter at hand. And I see some thumbs up on the screen here, which is the next best thing to seeing actual real life smiling faces. Uh, but um, I know that the spirit is there. Um, before I get into the topic matter at hand, and I wanna be cognizant of the time because I wanna leave plenty of time for your questions and comments and for a good discussion uh, starting at the top of the hour. Uh, before that, let me just say a few words about the George H.W. Bush Foundation for U.S.-China Relations. Um, the George H.W. Bush Foundation for U.S.-China Relations uh, has a very simple mission, to advance the U.S.-China relationship in ways that reflect the ethos, spirit, and values of President George H.W. Bush. No U.S. president ever came into office with a deeper understanding of China than President Bush, uh, just unquestionably. He had lived there for about 15 months as our U.S. envoy to China prior to normalization, and he brought with him to the Oval Office a very deep and textured understanding of China. If I were to summarize President Bush's vision and thinking on China in just two sentences, I would say this. President Bush believed that the U.S.-China relationship is the single most consequential relationship, uh, bilateral relationship in the world. And number two, that virtually no global challenge can be solved in the absence of constructive collaboration between the United States and China. And it's with those values in mind that we carry forward very proudly and frankly, very humbly, uh, the extraordinary legacy of President George H.W. Bush uh, one of our greatest sons as a nation, one of our greatest public servants, one of our truly great presidents, one of our great visionaries, and we're very proud to carry forward President Bush's vision for the U.S.-China relationship. Um, with that said, let me uh, map out what I'd like to do in my remarks today. Uh, first, I just want to say uh, that I'd like to share a little bit about the U.S.-China relationship uh, to kind of lay uh, the backdrop for where things are now. And then I want to spend most of the time uh, talking about why things are where they are and what the key issues are and the key areas of contention in the relationship are today, certainly from a U.S. vantage. Let's also recognize right at the outset that uh, one could look at the U.S.-China relationship from a Chinese perspective and probably hear a very different set of remarks. And I'm cognizant of that. That said, I will come at this from an American perspective and share with you my assessment of where we are in the relationship and why we are where we are. Uh, after that, I'll offer a brief assessment, um, personal or subjective judgment on my part as to um, how effective the Trump administration policies have been thus far with respect to China. Uh, and then uh, I'll offer a few um, concluding thoughts referencing the uh, 2020 campaign the way China figures into our politics, and uh, then some, some final thoughts before going into Q&A. So uh, that's what I hope to do between uh, now and the top of the hour. And I'll try to keep my eye on the clock so that we don't uh, shortchange uh, the questions and answers that I very much look forward to at the end of this session. Um, let me just start by talking about the US-China relationship uh, just at a very broad level. Um, the United States-China relationship today uh, is not what it was a few years ago. Uh, it is uh, probably at a low point in the modern era relative to uh, recent years and decades. I think we probably are at the lowest point overall in the relationship since normalization on January 1st, 1979. And I think there are a lot of different data points that we could point to to substantiate uh, that assertion. Uh, I just want to mention one of them now because I think it really does make very clear uh, just how dramatically the U.S.-China relationship has deteriorated in recent years and indeed in recent months. And that is that just a couple of months ago, the United States saw fit to shut down the Chinese consulate general in Houston, Texas. And as a tit-for-tat measure, 
uh, China saw fit to shut down the U.S. Consulate General in Chengdu in the province of Sichuan in China, also in the southwestern part of China, just as uh, the Houston Consulate General is in the southwestern part of our nation. So both consulates have been closed down. Um, this is something that I think, uh, first of all, is illustrative of the degree to which things have deteriorated. The closure of consulates uh, is an unprecedented um, occurrence in the modern history of U.S.-China relations. We have not seen anything like it since the two countries normalized diplomatic relations in 1979. And in fact, it is virtually an unprecedented occurrence anywhere in the world and in any time in history when you have two countries that are not at war with each other. It is a very unusual thing, and it is a very dramatic symbol of the degree to which the relationship and frankly the level of trust between the United States and China has really deteriorated. So there are other things that I could say, but I think that gives a sense for just how tough things are right now in the relationship. What I'd like to do now is to talk about, at least from an American perspective, uh, the issues that really are front and center in the US-China relationship at this time and the way that they have affected, uh, generally negatively, uh, the relationship between the United States and China. Uh, any one of these topics, and there's seven things that I'll mention briefly, probably for about three to four minutes per topic, um, any one of them could be virtually a graduate course unto itself. Any one of them could be alone a one hour or five hour lecture. But I'll just try to hit the high points and lay out where I think the sources of friction and tension are in the relationship between the United States and China today. Let's start with the big one and also the most recent one, and that is COVID-19. Uh, COVID-19 has had a profound and negative impact on Washington's views of China. Uh, COVID-19 has had a profound and negative impact on how the US public views China, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. <clears throat> and COVID-19 overall has had a very serious and negative impact on the US-China relationship itself. Um, there are a lot of things that one could say, but since COVID-19 reached our shores uh, in late February, early March, and really became a major issue for the American people in the first or second week of March of this year, just over six months ago. Uh, this issue has done more to take the U.S.-China relationship to a fundamentally different and worse place than any issue in the modern history of the U.S.-China relationship. The reason for that is because the United States President, President Trump, and advisors around him, members of the cabinet, and also members of the United States Congress, uh, disproportionately on the Republican side of the aisle, have made COVID-19 a major talking point as they communicate uh, with America and the world about COVID-19 and about China. And the basic message has been uh, by President Trump, his advisors, and uh, members, certain members of Congress that China willfully unleashed this, quote, plague, unquote, on the United States in an effort to kill Americans and in an effort to damage our society and our economy. Uh, I, uh, I don't accept that interpretation of events. I don't think most Americans do either. But that is a narrative and an interpretation that has been laid out by the president, those close to him, and certain members of the United States Congress. And it has resulted in a stark deterioration in how many Americans view China. Let me note, just to be very current, that just a couple of nights ago, we saw a US presidential debate. And in that debate, uh, President Trump stated and used, used the words when talking about COVID-19, when that topic was raised by the moderator, he referred to COVID-19 as, quote, the China plague, the China plague, unquote. Those were the words that President Trump used to describe what most of us refer to as COVID-19. Um, it just gives you a sense for the degree to which uh, COVID-19 has become a major talking point politically for those seeking to uh, criticize China and to uh, make China the culprit in the tragic loss of over 200,000 American lives and of course the devastating hit to the US economy that all of us have seen and experienced over the last 
six months. Um, so COVID-19 has been a game changer in the US-China relationship and it continues to resonate. And I'll come back to the ways that uh, that this uh, game-changing impact has been manifested. But before I do, I want to make just one more point about COVID-19 before I turn to the other topics briefly. And that is this. Um, COVID-19 uh, was, in my judgment, not well handled in its earliest stages by the Chinese government. I think China botched and bungled its early response to COVID-19. And I have said that publicly and on the record in English and in Chinese and in the Chinese media in the Chinese language. So I'm on record saying, I think China uh, badly mishandled or made significant mistakes in handling the COVID-19 crisis at the outset, mainly by not revealing as quickly as they could or should have uh, the deadliness of the disease and not doing so nearly as quickly and expeditiously as they, could, as they could and should have to warn others both in China and outside China. I'm on the record having said that. I do want to point out that the Trump administration and other critics in this country have said largely the same things for the most part in somewhat harsher terms and with harder, harsher language, in many cases unscientific language, such as by referencing, quote, the China plague or, quote, the China virus. Um, but I also want to say, and I think it needs to be said, uh, just in the interest of being, speaking factually, that the U.S. criticism of China, that China knew that this was a deadly virus and didn't tell anyone about that, didn't share that, um, is rendered, that criticism is rendered, uh, is neutralized, I would say, by the revelation that President Trump himself is on audio tape stating to Bob Woodward that he knew the virus was deadly and he chose not to share that information with the American people, as he put it, so as to not panic the American people. I don't wanna sit in judgment of that statement for any other reason than to make this point. It is very difficult uh, to criticize another country for a behavior uh, that the president of your own country has admitted on tape that he has engaged in. And so whatever credibility the United States generally has had in critiquing China's early response to COVID-19 has taken a very devastating hit by that revelation. Let me talk a little bit about the Hong Kong issue. Um, for a number of years now, on and off, and especially over the last year and a half or so, there have been very significant street demonstrations in the city of Hong Kong. Uh, there have been hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people on the streets at various points uh, protesting one thing or another, expressing uh, dissatisfaction, discontent uh, about various issues in Hong Kong, everything from housing prices and the economy to political issues, issues of uh, uh, jurisprudence and the law. And there has certainly been uh, an, uh, an outpouring of uh, popular protest in Hong Kong in recent years, and especially uh, over the last year plus, uh, almost year and a half. In response to that, China has, um, um, China which, uh, Hong, of which Hong Kong is a part, albeit in a very special status as a, as a kind of special administrative region. Uh, Hong Kong has, now has had put in place a law called the National Security Law that basically criminalizes, among other things, certain types of statements that individuals might make that relate to the concepts of treason, sedition, uh, sabotaging the social system or the political order, or other types of uh, related activities, uh, including, for example, uh, terrorist uh, incitement to terrorism and, and various other uh, issues. What the law does is it makes, uh, it, it turns into a criminal offense certain types of speech, among other types of uh, activity. And speech that in our country, in the United States, would be protected by the First Amendment. And here we are not talking about incitements to violence or yelling fire in a crowded movie theater, but other essentially political statements that would be protected in our country under the First Amendment are now um, subject to criminal prosecution in Hong Kong. I have said a number of times publicly that I think there are major problems with this law. Uh, and the main problem is that most of the definitions are very unclear, they're very vague, and thus 
what it is that one might say that could trigger prosecution, criminal prosecution under the terms of the law is unclear in many cases. And that obviously has a chilling effect in terms of free speech in Hong Kong, which has generally been protected over the years under Hong Kong's special system. Um, the other major problem that I see with the law, and that I think any person outside of China or outside of Hong Kong would see with it, is that China is seeking to extend extraterritorial jurisdictional reach to the entire world. So that if somebody in the great state of South Carolina stood up in the city of Columbia or Charleston and made a statement about Hong Kong that the Chinese legal authorities uh, judged to, uh, to be criminal and a violation of the national security law, that technically China is reserving the right, and it states this explicitly in the law, to issue an arrest warrant for an American citizen speaking in Columbia, South Carolina. I think that is immensely problematic. Uh, that's something that even we don't do, uh, let alone most other countries in the world, uh, to say that something that you say overseas could subject you to criminal liability. And I think that's an audacious uh, overreach, in my opinion, with respect to the attempted jurisdictional reach. And so there are problems with the law. As a result, the United States has sanctioned uh, those that it judges uh, were involved in creating and crafting and implementing the law, and has also taken other measures uh, relative to so uh, Hong Kong, some of which I think may have the unintended consequence of hurting the good people of Hong Kong, who are not the ones responsible for this law going on the books. But nevertheless, there has been a series of actions that the United States has taken in response. And so Hong Kong has become a significant uh, flashpoint in the US-China relationship. Let me move on to the topic of trade. I'll try to be brief on these. Again, much could be said. All of us know that uh, the trade issue, U.S.-China trade, has, be, has been a major league issue in the U.S.-China relationship uh, for a long time, but particularly dating back to the spring of 2018, when Donald Trump uh, initiated what is now generally referred to as the trade war uh, with China by uh, adopting uh, and levying tariffs on an increasingly large swath of Chinese imports into the United States. Um, uh, I'll come back to the topic of tariffs and how, how effective or ineffective those policies have been later. But here, what I want to say is that the Trump administration has seen fit to levy tariffs, which are taxes, by the way, uh, on American importers of uh, Chinese goods, uh, basically across the board. So hundreds of billions of dollars uh, worth of Chinese imports have been subjected to tariffs. And uh, the idea on the part of the Trump administration is to try to put pressure on China to make the playing field more level, to uh, generate greater symmetry in the US-China trade and investment relationship and business relationship, and uh, basically to uh, create a, a fairer um, operating environment. I think all of those are very good goals. I think all of those are very legitimate goals for the United States. But what I would say, and I'll come back to this later, is that I think the Trump administration has correctly diagnosed the problem, as did previous administrations. But I think that the Trump administration, for reasons that I'll explain shortly, uh, has uh, uh, issued a prescription for the wrong medicine to resolve the problem. And I'll elaborate on that shortly. But suffice it to say, for purposes here, that the trade relationship is front and center in the US-China relationship and is a major, major issue uh, that continues to be contentious. Let me also note that in January of this year, the United States and China theoretically made, uh, uh, met and uh, came to an agreement, an agreement referred to as the trade, as the phase one trade deal between the United States and China. Many people, myself included, were skeptical that that phase one trade deal was going to really have any discernible impact on uh, the, the major issues that were laid out. Uh, and many of those issues are real. And by the way, China has played unfairly with respect to trade uh, in, in its dealings with the United States, no question about that. But uh, many were skeptical that that deal would resolve those issues. That being said, COVID-19 essentially blew the deal out of the water. Uh, and now it's uh, kind of in a um, in stagnation uh, until such time as probably COVID-19 um, is uh, worked through 
and until such time in all likelihood uh, that we get past the U.S. election so that there is a political environment in this country one way or the other that uh, meaningful discussions on trade can continue and can resume. But trade remains a very serious issue in the relationship. I'll come back to that in a minute to cite some data that talks about looking at the effectiveness of Trump policies. The, the fourth area I wanna mention, having talked about COVID-19, Hong Kong and trade, is technology. I'll just be brief. When we talk about US-China competition, um, I think what most people really are talking about in the most immediate sense is the competition around technology. Both the United States and China are seeking to become uh, or in the case of the United States, to remain uh, the preeminent technology superpower that the world has ever known. China seeks to become a technology superpower. And so there is a tension between the United States and, and China and the two countries' ambitions when it comes to exerting primacy or uh, attaining primacy in the technological sphere. There is a real competition there. Let me also say at this juncture that both with respect to uh, technology, but also with respect to a set of issues that's broader than technology, China is the most formidable national competitor that the United States will ever face in the lifetime of every American who is living and breathing today, including an infant born in Colombia today, as we speak. In that infant's lifetime, uh, China will be the most uh, formidable national competitor to our nation, uh, bar none. And that is absolutely true. Uh, technology is one of the spheres where that is playing out. Uh, and there is a very intense competition between the United States and China to um, get to the top and to be uh, essentially the technology superpower of the world. Uh, this revolves around issues like artificial intelligence, quantum physics, um, autom uh, advanced uh, uh, robotics, uh, 5G and, and telecommunications infrastructure and a host of other issues. This issue remains very contentious. And again, much more we could say about it, but it is one of the trust drainers in the US-China relationship. Let me speak briefly about military and security issues. Um, military and security issues uh, remain an ongoing uh, source of friction uh, in the US-China uh, di uh, dialogue or the US-China relationship. Uh, the United States and China simply have very different views on a set of uh, issues around uh, military and security issues, particularly in, in Asia, uh, in East Asia, the East Asian Pacific region. Um, and uh, I could give you a couple of um, salient examples. One is obviously the South China Sea, where uh, China does things that the U.S. certainly regards and I think rightly regards as very problematic. Uh, and where from a Chinese perspective, it should be noted, the United States does things uh, that China uh, believes is problematic. That being said, I believe that China's positioning on the issue of the disputed uh, uh, merit, merit, the maritime and territorial disputes in the South China Sea is indefensible. Uh, and it's been judged to be so by the international legal community. That being said, those issues are outstanding and those issues continue to play out. Likewise, the topic of Taiwan remains a very sensitive topic in the, in the context of U.S.-China relations. The U.S. continues to sell arms to Taiwan, something that greatly angers the leadership of China, which considers Taiwan to be a kind of renegade province of China. Um, and China takes great issue with U.S. sales of arms to Taiwan. Uh, I support U.S. arms sales to Taiwan. I've been on Capitol Hill on that issue and written and spoken about it extensively but it is a trust drainer from the Chinese vantage uh, in the US-China relationship. That being said, uh, for the most part, I would say that the military and security issues uh, between the United States and China today are actually relatively, I say relatively quiet. Not that there's nothing going on, but compared to COVID-19, compared to Hong Kong, uh, which is an issue, uh, the law that I mentioned came on the books uh, in early July, so it's a very current issue. Uh, and obviously the issues of trade and technology, I think all of those outpace um, the military set of issues as being uh, most sensitive at this particular moment. That said, those military and security issues remain. Uh, the last couple of things I wanna mention is that uh, a couple of issues that are uh, problematic in the US-China relationship, uh, certainly from a US vantage, uh, 
uh, are the notion of China's so-called, quote, influence operations, unquote, in the United States, by which people re are referring to China's efforts to inform and influence US public opinion in support of their foreign policies. Um, another term for influence operations is public diplomacy. Every nation in the world engages in public diplomacy, including ours. I know because I used to do public diplomacy for the US Department of State uh, when I was a US diplomat. And every country of any size uh, and with any budget does public diplomacy activities designed to inform and influence public opinion, foreign public opinion in support of your foreign policy objectives. There are a lot of people in Washington that have taken great issue with what they regard as China's some, somehow nefarious or inappropriate uh, or illegitimate efforts to influence discourse in this country. Um, the topic of Confucius Institutes often comes up in this context, but there are other uh, topics that come up as well. This is one of the few areas where we look at, where I look at the kind of the list, the laundry list that the United States have of issues, the United States has of issues that are sore points in the relationship. And I think this is the area where there is the least um, evidentiary basis to have uh, the kind of uh, con concern that the United States government has expressed, whereas with the other areas, whether they are with respect to mishandling of COVID-19, trade, technology, and so on, there are very legitimate areas um, uh, where the United States has leveled, I think, justified cr criticism of China. But I will say with respect to the notion of China's so-called influence operations, the fact is every country seeks to influence foreign public discourse China is no different. It uses some different methodologies. No one has alleged that China has done anything illegal for one reason, they haven't. And the things that China does are basically protected by the United States Constitution and probably fall into the category of issues where the solution to the problem would be far worse than the problem. We could say more about that, but I wanna note that the issue of what some regard as China's quote, influence operations otherwise known as public diplomacy in our country uh, is seen as something that is somehow nefarious and problematic, uh, though no one in the administration has ever, ever put one scintilla of evidence on the public record uh, documenting anything actually improper. Um, so that, uh, that's that issue. The final issue I wanna mention, and I, I leave it last for a particular reason, kind of to make a point, is the issue of human rights. And the issue of human rights remains a contentious issue in the US-China relationship. Um, China's human rights record is very poor. Um, the United States uh, has historically often uh, made critical comments of certain human rights practices in China. Um, and human rights as a general issue remains an issue uh, in the relationship and often an area of contention. Around this issue, I wanna make a couple of quick points before I transition to kind of start wrapping up and as I try to keep an eye on the time here. Um, with respect to human rights, one thing I would observe about the Trump administration is that the Trump administration has actually been very mute uh, on human rights in China specifically. Uh, it's, it's probably been the quietest administration on the topic of human rights abuses in China of any US administration in history. I think that can, certainly at the presidential level, that is to say all previous presidents spoke more themselves, the presidents, spoke more about human rights than this president has. I don't think that is even remotely in dispute. And I think it's probably fair to say that this administration, and one can judge it rightly or wrongly without making a judgment here, this administration has said less about human rights than any other U.S. administration uh, probably in history. Um, one of the things that I think is, um, is an issue that has come up in recent years since uh, the spring of 2017, shortly after the election of Donald Trump, is the much reported issue of the abuses that are being perpetrated on the Uyghur minority, uh, um, the Uyghur minority in Xinjiang, China, in the northwest part of the country. Basically, people who are Uyghurs, who are, who are Muslims, a Muslim a minority in China, an ethnic minority in China, are in large numbers being placed in camps that China refers to as vocational training camps, but that are often uh, surrounded by barbed wire, et cetera. And they're basically um, uh, being placed in these camps on a massive scale, a scale that we've never 
uh, seen uh, in the modern era in China. Um, one thing that I think is not often noted, but that perhaps should be noted, is that this action on China's part did not begin until Donald Trump took office as president of the United States. And I think that's just a very interesting data point. That's a factual data point. That's not an expression of an opinion. This didn't start until the spring of 2017. And I think as Americans, we might want to ask ourselves why. Why did this start very shortly after Donald Trump became president? And I think it points to two things. One, the de-emphasis on human rights in this particular administration. And number two, that the notion that somehow we're talking tough to China or being tough on China, the notion that that's making any difference in how they do things, I think is emphatically disproven by the empirical fact that this very egregious um, uh, violation of rights in Western China did not occur until this president came to power. Didn't occur under President Obama or previous presidents of either party, uh, though other abuses have occurred all along. So I, I think that we just have to recognize that while some in this country may say they are talking tough, the bottom line results are really the things that matter. And I think that it's remarkably telling that this is playing out on this president's watch. Let me also just make a, a couple of other points on the issue of human rights. And, and these are really important points, I think, for our nation. And that is number one, um, I think it's really important that when the, United, when the United States speaks out on human rights, as I believe we should, and I think as almost all Americans believe we should, that w whether it's in China or anywhere else. And by the way, let's make no mistake, we have done some terrible things to our own people in this country. And let us be humbled by that fact. We shouldn't be sitting in judgment of everyone else as if our own record is perfect. I think there are millions and hundreds of millions of, of Americans that have come to the realization that we, do, we, are not, we have not always been angels in this country to our own people. And we're seeing protests play out across this country uh, that are giving voice and expression to that, to one facet of that issue. So that being said, I think that we are most effective when we speak out on human rights about other countries' actions, when we can bring a certain level of moral credibility to those uh, critiques. I have to say, uh, and I think it needs to be said, that one of the things that has disappointed me uh, as an American is that we have really lost a lot of ground in terms of our moral credibility on human rights, candidly under this president. Uh, and by that, let me, let me point to two specific things because I, I will admit, I am old fashioned. I, I do believe that when one makes a statement, that individual ought to have facts to back up that statement. So I'm old fashioned in that regard, but let me offer two data points to substantiate what I just said. Number one, when you have a US president who characterizes the United States media as quote, enemies of the people, unquote, enemies of the people, unquote. How in the world does that president, that U.S. president, then go to China and say, we have concerns about media freedom in China? It shatters, it shatters and destroys our nation's credibility uh, in this regard. And it's been saddening to see uh, the degree to which our credibility on these issues uh, has deteriorated in the last three and a half years. Let me make one other point that's even more current. In the debate uh, a couple of nights ago, uh, President Trump, when offered the opportunity to condemn white supremacy uh, in this country, didn't do it. How do you not condemn white supremacy in the United States of America or anywhere that it rears its ugly and despicable head, and then go on to criticize China for how it treats its ethnic minorities in Western China. That level of hypocrisy is devastating for our nation. And again and again, we've seen that play out. Um, it is something that I think we need to talk more about in this country because I think our nation should speak out on human rights issues. All nations that feel the need to should do so. But we need to realize that we can only be effective speaking out on these issues if we have some modicum of credibility on human rights uh, and 
while we do have some modicum of credibility, it is not the same level of credibility that we have had in years past. I think that needs to be said. Let me just make a point now, turning uh, toward the conclusion of my remarks, uh, and I may go probably five minutes longer than I wanted to go. I'll try to be brief here, but again, there, there's a lot that could be said. I just wanna ask the question, how effective have the Trump administration policies toward China been uh, for our nation, for the United States of America? I'm not worried about the impact on China. I'm worried about the impact, and I'm, I'm, I'm asking about the impact on the United States. Well, the answer to that question is the policies have done very poorly. Uh, under, let me use the trade area as an example, since this is the incredible Moore School of Business, one of the great business schools in this country, and the number one international business MBA in, in the world, uh, in, my, in my book. Um, let me focus on business for that reason, to, because we're at the Moore School um, in business and trade. Here's the facts. Here, here's the actual empirical facts. These facts come from the Trump administration. This is data that's publicly available from the Trump administration. Under these policies, the tariff policies of this administration, the US merchandise deficit with China is greater than it's ever been. The average US merchandise deficit with China over this presidency is greater than it has ever been in all previous presidencies. So it's not just a one year phenomenon. The average amount of the deficit is in, is in, ex, in excess of all previous presidencies, not just year to year. The two greatest US deficits with the world have been registered by this administration. The number one and the number two largest US merchandise deficits with the world have occurred on President Trump's watch because of President Trump's policies. Uh, manufacturing jobs in this country have been lost, not gained. 237,000 manufacturing jobs are gone relative to January 20th, 2017. There are 237,000 fewer jobs in manufacturing in South Carolina and across the country today than there were on January 20th, 2017. Uh, farmers are having a devil of a time selling their commodities to China. Instead, the Trump administration has offered them a government handout that they don't want or need uh, to partially displace the income they've lost by not being able to sell soybeans and other things to China. In other words, we're giving farmers an income they don't want or need with money that the national treasury doesn't have. Pretty good definition of socialism in my book. And farmers are up in arms saying, we've got to have these tariffs in because we are losing the family farm and the list goes on. And I, might I add another factual data point from this administration, from the Trump administration, is that for the first time in the modern history of America, and the first time since normalization in 1979, we now, as we sit here, have, a, have an agricultural goods deficit with China, when before President Trump, we had an agricultural goods surplus with China. That's from the Trump administration. Finally, all consumers, all of us here, all of us on this call, uh, are paying between $800 and $1,500 more per year at Walmart and Target than we were two years ago. It is not a good record for America, not a good record for South Carolina, which exports about $35 billion a year. Guess who your number one export destination is? Yes, it's China. Um, I see Jerry on. I'll be done, in, Jerry, in just about two minutes. Uh, I'll, 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 I'm cognizant of the time. Uh, trade matters to South Carolina. That's why the, chamber, the president of the Chamber of Commerce of South Carolina stood up and said, these tariffs are killing us. Not his exact words, but his exact sentiment. That's why chambers all across the country and Republic, conservative Republican governors all across the country have written those same words in open letters to President Trump. So the, so the policies aren't working. And I think the reason I'm cutting parts out here for time, the reason they're not working is because of two things. They're predicated on the wrong assumptions and they're predicated on falsehoods, not facts. And I could drill down on that, but we are somehow surprised that the policies are not doing what they're supposed to do. I'm not surprised. They're doing exactly what many of us predicted, including myself two and a half years ago. They are killing American jobs and they are hurting our economy. And that's why we've been uh, we, uh, an outspoken critics of the tariffs per se. Let me conclude, uh, there's more I could say. There's a major partisan divide around China, 20 to 40 points depending on the question with Republicans always more harsher on China than Democrats. 
I could drill down on that, but I won't here. I just want to conclude by saying I think things are going to get worse before they get better. Uh, China is going to be a key theme in this presidential election. Um, things may or may not change after the election, depending on what happens uh, on November 3rd and in the weeks and months that may, it may take to sort out what happens on November 3rd. Um, but let me say this in conclusion. China is, as I said earlier, the most formidable national competitor that our nation will ever have in the lifetimes of every living, breathing American alive today. However, it is not our enemy. It is not our enemy. And the grandest strategic blunder that the United States could ever make would be to turn China into an enemy it did not have to be. And one of the things that we're very focused on at the George H.W. Bush Foundation for U.S.-China relations, carrying forward the vision of President George H.W. Bush is doing everything in our power to ensure that the nation, that our nation, uh, uh, does not see an outcome in which China becomes uh, an enemy that it didn't have to be. With that, I want to thank Jerry and everyone for this opportunity, and I very much look forward to your questions and comments, and thank you so much again for this opportunity. All right, David, uh, thank you so much. This has been a great, great talk. You covered so many key issues with respect to China and China and the US. And I am inundated. It's like a, a hose, a fire hose coming at me with questions and comments. And let me, um, let me start with trade, where you left off, because we've got a, many questions on trade. And I guess the basic, and, and I understand this too, I, um, the basic question that we're getting here is, what would you, clearly there's a problem with the way US and China have developed their trade over the past say 20 to 30 years and the US needed to pivot something else. And there were different ideas on the table. There was the P TPP approach, uh, there's the trade war approach, there are other things. How do you see a potential approach that would work where the, you know, you're not block shutting this whole thing down, but the U.S. is gaining a, a better foothold in that relationship? Uh, Jerry, it's a great question. Uh, let me say a couple of things. One, uh, I think the first, the, the first rule of public policy, and, you know, I studied public policy at the master's level. The first rule of public policy is come up with solutions that aren't worse than the problem. Um, what we've seen over the last three and a half years fail that test because the solution to the problem has now generated uh, a status quo that is inferior to the status quo ante uh, as measured in deficits, as measured in jobs, as measure, measured in manufacturing, in farm uh, data, and the list goes on. It's, it's not working well. So the first thing that I would say is uh, kind of a version of the Hippocratic Oath, but for public policymakers, and that is uh, do no further harm and undo the harm that we've done to ourselves by making a, a bad situation uh, worse uh, through our own uh, policy choices. So uh, getting, you know, getting rid of the tariffs is not a Republican or Democratic concept. It is an idea that is rooted in the idea that um, in order for our economy to succeed, we need to tax our importers and our consumers less. And tariffs are taxes. Tariffs distort trade, tariffs kill jobs, and tariffs make things more expensive for all of us. So that's the first thing I would say. Just to your broader point, I would say that um, a, a couple of other things. Number one, let's sit down, and, and, and I could give you a much more detailed answer, but I can't do it right here because of time constraints. But let me give you the contours of it, Jerry, and, and, and all, all friends here. Um, number one, let's have discrete negotiations that don't play out over Twitter. Uh, because just stylistically, it's not very effective. It boxes people into a corner from the standpoint of their political context and their public opinion context. And it ends up being counterproductive for us uh, and uh, not necessarily conducive to getting better outcomes in negotiations. Number two, let's not alienate and pick fights with our allies. Uh, and our trade partners, our closest trade partners, we ought to be working with Japan, with South Korea, with Europe, and many other nations around the world to collectively put pressure on China uh, in a more discreet way to rectify some of the real asymmetries that do exist there 
and the practices that in fact are problematic. Look, the, there are problematic practices. There's no question about it. The question is how do you get at those? And I think you have to get at them uh, in greater numbers and you have not rather than unilaterally. And I have to, I think you have to get at them more surgically. Um, so those are two of the points that I would make, uh, three really, uh, get rid of the tariffs, undo the self-inflicted damage, and then work with others in these different ways uh, to actually get at the real issues. And I think there is a way to do that. But I want to come back to a very key point just to conclude this point. I don't, I don't want to go on too long because I want there to be plenty of time for questions. And that is, um, we can't be emotional about these matters of public policy. We have to actually look at what the second and third order effects of our policies are. And it may feel good to some to say, let's get them, let's put tariffs on them. It reminds me of that, uh, I think it was a Verizon commercial where the rich uh, corporate CEO was sitting behind the desk and his assistant was saying, you know, talking to him and the guy has the phone and he says, uh, I have this great plan from uh, Verizon or Sprint, I guess it was Sprint and it's a great plan and this is my way, the corporate CEO, this is my way of sticking it to the man. And the assistant says, but you are the man. And the corporate CEO says, well, yes. And the assistant says, so you're sticking it to yourself. And the corporate CEO says, maybe. Well, that is probably the single best encapsulation of what we've done. We've stuck it to ourselves, which is why I call it hurt America first, hurt America worst. We have to stop doing that as the first step to getting back on track with trade. Okay, so I think you are right. One thing we know from international political economy and uh, 70 years of history is that a coalition approach is usually much more stable, much more effective when dealing with transnational problems like a trade. Um, many questions, of course, then, for instance, about COVID and trade. How do you understand, how do you see this idea of so-called supply chain retrenchment. China's take, uh, Japan has taken active moves. Other countries taken active moves to rethink their international supply chains. What's going on in China? How are China, Chinese firms going to react? Are we going to see a decrease in Chinese business opportunities, or are they going to come up with another counter uh, a policy to deal with that? Well, uh, it's a great question. Let me say a couple of things. Um, I come from a school of thought, Jerry, and I would guess that you probably do as well, and, and probably the University of South Carolina, Darla Moore uh, School of Business probably does generally, uh, that I accept the concept of comparative advantage. I just accept that that is, in fact, a valid uh, economic, international economic theory, that when you operate on the principle of comparative advantage, the pie gets larger. We now have... Um, a, an official Washington, let's say the US administration plus Congress, and it's across party lines to a large degree, uh, to be fair, that is saying, uh, but it's, it's more Republican than Democrat, but it is bipartisan, that's saying, let's now reject the very construct of comparative advantage, and let's try to go back to an autarkic system, meaning uh, let's kind of fend for ourselves and not rely on China or others. You know, a virus could come from anywhere uh, and has. Um, this one came out of, evidently came out of Wuhan um, uh, originally. It certainly was first discovered there, but it could come out of any number of places and has historically over the history of the world. Um, that being said, are we going to truly uh, try to shield our uh, supply chains from any exposure to the international world, to other markets, to other producers, to other uh, economic partners, be they China or be they uh, allies of the United States or others. I don't think it is a realistic um, path forward. I don't think it is a, uh, a, a path forward to pro continued prosperity for our country. Um, international trade makes the pie bigger for everyone. How countries distribute the benefits of that trade in terms of income equality or inequality is an important domestic policy issue that countries need to look at from, through the domestic policy prism. But the science, the, the, if you will, economic science or social science of the matter that I think is uncontested is that the notion of comparative advantage works. It creates bigger pies. 
we now have an official Washington, including the president, but also Congress, that is actually saying to the American people, we want the pie to be smaller. And secondly, we want to distribute the pie more equally, even as we rail against, quote, Wall Street fat cats. Uh, and by the way, in the same breath as one is lauding the record-breaking stock market performance, but that's a different irony. Um, well, I've heard people talk about decreasing the pie and being poor, but more equally distributed in terms of wealth. That's from Karl Marx. That's not what we've ever stood for in this country. Uh, we've always stood for increasing the pie and generating efficiency and hopefully through domestic policy, making sure that everyone has a stake in that success and that prosperity. So I think that um, any long-term notion of really fundamentally doing away with global supply chains, whether they're from China, in China or anywhere else, is a misguided notion. But again, let me just say what is clear. Uh, I am a pro-business, pro-growth, pro-market, pro-trade, uh, pro-globalization person. I'm also pro-shareholder, pro-worker, pro-farmer, pro-rancher, and pro-consumer. All of those positions put me at odds with the Trump administration. Right. Okay. So let's pivot now to a couple of questions about Chinese uh, security policy in the region. You already brought this up in the beginning with Hong Kong. So I have a cluster of questions. First, uh, and they all go together, and you could take them as you see. You know, is the one country, two systems viable approach? Okay, that's one thing. You know, are we going to see uh, basically, the, the, you know, in 10 years, Hong Kong will have been fundamentally changed, or do you see some sort of new other path? Um, how long people are asking, will Taiwan be an independent country, if you want to call it that? And lastly, who is going to stop China on this encroachment on these islands around the South China Sea? You know, we have the Spratly Island precedents. Um, most people are getting lots and lots of feed here that there's no end in sight. So um, on that <laughs> order, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and the islands. Uh, thanks, Jerry. And th again, thanks to the, qu to the folks that are raising these questions. Um, on Hong Kong, um, just to be fairly brief, because I want to get to all of these questions and more, um, the national security law episode that has played out over this summer, and, and beca it became law, as I mentioned, in early July, um, really dealt a blow. Uh, to uh, the notion of one country, two systems. For anyone that thought before that, that one country, two systems was going to be palatable uh, either to the people of Hong Kong or kind of through the Hong Kong example to the people of Taiwan, which we'll talk about that in a second, uh, those hopes were dashed uh, by the advent of this law and the implementation of this law, which really essentially if I may say, uh, makes a mockery of the concept of one country, two systems. Um, I don't think that um, one country, two systems is a viable model in the minds of people in Taiwan for Taiwan. In other words, it's not a viable model for Taiwan in the minds of the 23 million people in Taiwan. And I will just note that uh, historically what I've seen is that people in the mainland look at Hong Kong and they say rhetorically, see, look how well this works. Isn't this what you would like to see, our compatriots uh, in Taiwan? And the people in Taiwan look at Hong Kong and see the same thing and come away with the judgment that is never, ever something that we would want to have. And the, I, don't, I think historically, my good friends in the mainland have not fully understood how that is seen by the people in Taiwan but I am telling you, there is no appetite in Taiwan for what, uh, what exists now in terms of one country, two systems with Hong Kong. Going to Taiwan, the topic of Taiwan, um, I think Taiwan will exist, will continue to exist in its current status uh, indefinitely. Uh, and, you know, I, I won't say permanently, but let me just say indefinitely. Because I think the one thing that is absolutely true is that it would take the mainland uh, having to use force to uh, militarily subjugate and take over Taiwan for Taiwan ever to be uh, brought back into the fold. 
In my judgment, and I've said this publicly, I've said it in testimony on Capitol Hill, I've written about it, and I've been, um, I've, I've spoken about this issue a lot over many years. In my judgment, uh, the people of Taiwan uh, do not want reunification. Uh, they have a very independent sense of identity that is quite distinct in a number of very important regards from the sense of identity on the mainland. And uh, barring military takeover, which I don't see uh, happening. It's not that there's not tension around uh, in the cross-strait uh, military um, kind of context, uh, but I don't see it happening, certainly in any time in the near future. Uh, and I don't think it will happen because the cost of doing it would be very, very great, probably unacceptable to China. Uh, barring military takeover, I, I think Taiwan stays as it is for the indefinite future and for decades to come. This has been an incredibly fascinating discussion with you. Uh, we have a million more questions, but it's, it's, I think we got to do another one. When, when the COVID thing ends, we're going to have you back uh, and uh, in, in person. Uh, it looks like you're going to have throngs of people interested in meeting you and talking to you. Uh, but once again, really, we're so grateful for your time and your thoughts. Uh, it's been a wonderful learning experience with you, and we hope to see you again. And thanks to everybody who has been here. And, and I want to remind our audience, too, in about a month, we'll, coming to, uh, we'll have some news out soon, we'll have Preston Keat, the head of Sovereign Risk of UBS, talking about the, onco uh, the upcoming global risks for 2021. So David, thanks a lot, and you take care. Thank you. Spurs up, y'all. Good luck Saturday. Thanks, Jerry. See y'all soon.